Okay. Well, um, thank you very much uh, for organizing this conference and for attending my talk. Um, so what I would like to do is to examine how uh, something like the integration challenge arises in the case of action. And I will speak for brevity of action, but I will mean intentional action. Uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with the point that a certain event or process uh, under a certain description can be plausibly considered as an intentional action and under a different description does not seem to be an intentional action. So suppose uh, something is happening and we can describe that as the fact that I am baking a cake, say. Uh, under that description, that event presumably is an intentional action. But by making, by baking a cake, maybe I'm also making noise because I'm moving trays and stuff. And thereby I'm disturbing my, my girlfriend who is trying to work um, in the other room. If we describe that thing in, in that way as making noise or disturbing my girlfriend, presumably it's not an intentional action. Okay. So that's just to say, I will focus on events described in such a way that they can plausibly be considered intentional actions. Okay. Um, in, in this first um, bit, I will briefly set up the, the materials for the integration challenge. And I will make two points, one about the metaphysics, one about the epistemology of action, um, which I will not really be arguing for, but I will sort of ask you, at least initially, to take them for granted. And then we'll see how the integration challenge might arise. So, metaphysically speaking, what I want to say is that intentional actions are events that constitutively involve external reality. They happen in a shared, objective, intersubjective reality. Okay. To put it very synthetically, as Elizabeth Anscombe does, uh, she says, I do what happens, what happens in outside. So intentional action is not something that happens in our head. It's, it's something that involves external reality. Um, later on, I will slightly rephrase this in terms of causality by saying that actions are something that bring about causal changes in the world, but we will have time for this. So, so much for the metaphysics. Uh, the epistemology of intentional action, I think is such that we know our own intentional actions non-observationally. So what does that mean? Well, suppose I am indeed baking a cake and you ask me, what are you doing? If I answer something along the lines of, well, let me check, ah, it looks like I'm baking a cake. If I give that sort of answer, either I'm being sarcastic for some strange reason, or I am not intentionally baking a cake. If I have to check first what I'm doing in order to be able to answer this. So the idea is that in, in case of intentional actions, we are able to answer the question, what are we doing? straight off, so to speak, without having to check. And that's the, the epistemological point about intentional action. Um, now, in the, what I want you to, to say in the second section is that this non-observational knowledge um, fits the description of what philosophers usually describe as self-knowledge. And I will argue that while there is a certain kind of way of thinking about self-knowledge that when applied about um, intentional action makes it so that the integration challenge arises. That is, makes it so that the metaphysical points I made and the epistemological points are difficult to integrate with one another. A couple of words about self-knowledge in general. So when philosophers talk about self-knowledge, usually they, just, they don't just mean knowledge of facts about oneself, such as, you know, uh, just, just any fact about oneself, such as one's age or one's nationality or things like that. No, 
They mean knowledge of one's own mental states, experiences, and so on and so forth. And they mean a kind of knowledge that has certain characteristics. One is what is sometimes called in, an immunity to error through misidentification. That is to say, if one says, well, if I say, well, someone believes that P, but is it me who believes that P? Well, if I have self-knowledge about my belief, this kind of question does not arise. I, I know whether I believe that P. And the thought is that, well, if, if, in, if knowledge of intentional action fits the general description of self-knowledge, there too, there shouldn't be something like wondering, well, someone is baking a cake, but is it me who is baking a cake? Okay. And the second characteristic, which, is, which will be the most central for what I'm about to say, is that self-knowledge has this known observational character. That is, I can tell you what I believe or experience or desire and so on and so forth without having to, 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 to check on evidential relations or to, to metaphorically explore my mind with some sort of uh, uh, searchlight, right? I, I, I just know what I believe and think and so on and so forth. And if the epistemological point I made about intentional action is right, I also know non-observationally what I do intentionally. Okay. So I agree on these two general points about self-knowledge. But the problem is that a sort of traditional assumption about self-knowledge, I think it's a very broadly Cartesian assumption, is that this kind of self-knowledge is confined to an inner realm, to something interior, something as something like beliefs, thoughts, desires, experiences, and so on and so forth. But this, this kind of self-knowledge cannot extends to the external world, to what happens in the external world, so to speak, okay? So if, that, if that's true, then it seems that non-observational knowledge of what happens when I act intentionally mm, seems problematic. And that means that for, according to, the, to, to this traditional assumption, um, knowledge of our own intentional actions would have to be a sort of complex state which is the result of on the one hand non-observational knowledge of one's own intention which is something inner to speak supplemented by observational knowledge of one's own action of what happens outside now, I'm not going to argue directly against this two-factor approach to knowledge about action. I'm just going to remark that if this is the case, then we cannot really reconcile the metaphysical point and the epistemological point they've made about um, actions, intentional actions, because given what an intentional action is, is something that happens in the outside, so to speak, in, in, in outer reality, but at the same time, something that happens in outer reality cannot be the object of non-observational knowledge. But I've claimed that we know non-observationally our, our own intentional actions. So if the, the traditional view is, is right, then we have a problem squaring the metaphysics and epistemology of intentional action. Okay. Um, what I would like to do in the remaining of the talk is to simply try to articulate an alternative model for thinking about an alternative relative to this traditional model, alternative model of thinking about um, intentional action. And this alternative model, um, although I will not directly argue that it's correct, I will say, well, it can make sense of the, the, the metaphysical and epistemological points that I've mentioned at the beginning. So that is to say, it, 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 um, it lives up to the, to the integration challenge. Okay. Um, so in order to set up this alternative model, I will need to um, describe a certain category of capacities for action, which I will call rational capacities. It's not particularly important that we call them that way. I have my reasons for doing this, but it's not very important. 
these rational capacities, which I'm about to describe, are uh, rational capacity is, is a category that is larger than capacities for action, although I will obviously focus on capacities for action. I will give you a few examples and then I will try to give a more general characterization. So by rational capacities, I mean capacities such as the capacity to prove a theorem or speaking and speaking slash understanding a language and obviously practical things, capacities for action such as building something or imagine a doctor or surgeon treating a patient or the capacity to spell words correctly, or capacity to cook something or playing an instrument and so on and so forth. And just to give you a very rough idea of, like, uh, by, by means of a contrastive understanding, capacities which we have, which I think we would categorize as non-rational capacities are capacities such as that of digesting food or applying a certain weight on a chair simply by sitting on it, or passive dispositions such as being moved around or feeling experience or experiencing physical pain and so on. But now what 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 is it that unifies or distinguishes rational capacities? Well, I want to suggest that these rational capacities afford a distinctive kind of explanation of certain processes and outcomes. So remember when Anscom says, I do what happens? Well, these capacities afford the distinctive explanation of what happens, these processes and outcomes. And the explanation is peculiar in the sense that it joins causality and self-consciousness. I will say for, 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 for a minute at this very high level of generality, and then I will give you a concrete example and hopefully things will become clearer. The explanation I have in mind is causal in a very broad sense, that is in the sense that it explains why the world is as it is in certain respects. You can think again of Anscombe's formulation of, I do what happens. It explains what happens, why the world is now as it is. And I've also said it joins causality and self-consciousness. What I mean more specifically is something quite strong actually, is to say that the self-conscious exercise of these capacities is itself constitutive of the causal efficacy of these capacities. That is to say, the self-consciousness of the exercise partly explains why the exercise of the capacity is bringing about certain things in external reality. Now we'll give you an example, otherwise um, I don't think it will, it will become clear. So imagine, um, imagine the case of a child who is tracing, who has just traced a series of signs on, pay, on a piece of paper and that these, um, these signs make up the, the English word house. And if you want, you can, you can also imagine that she can consistently do that with other English words. Okay. Now here we have a process, the series of bodily movements and an outcome, that is the, the written signs actually making up a word, okay? And we want an explanation of why these things are happening. Now, a plausible explanation is that um, the child has and is exercising the capacity to spell. And this kind of explanation is causal insofar as it explains why the world is as it is in these respects, in the respects of the movements of the child's hand and in respect of what, what now is there, these, these written signs on paper. At the same time, it is plausible that um, the child is a self-conscious about the exercise of the capacity. That is, she's aware that she's spelling. This Self-consciousness might be manifested in a number of ways. One is that perhaps she might be able to, to teach another child how to spell that word, which presupposes she's aware of what she's doing and how. But the, the main point I want to make is that, well, this self-consciousness is itself part of the causality which brings about these signs. To, 
to appreciate these points, imagine a slightly alternative scenario. Imagine now that the child, in fact, has no idea whatsoever of what it is to spell. She's just moving her hand at random and by sheer coincidence, actual English words appear on paper. Now, in this alternative scenario, whatever explains this outcome, these signs, it cannot be the capacity to spell because she has no such capacity. She has no idea whatsoever what it is to spell. Which suggests in turn that if we remove the self-consciousness from the exercise of the capacity, it turns out that the capacity itself loses its explanatory role. In this alternative scenario where she has no idea what she's doing, the capacity to spell does not explain anything in this case. By contrast, if we take what I've called non-rational capacities, say the capacity to digest, in that case, self-consciousness doesn't really have a role to play. So uh, if everything goes well, when we digest food, we are not even aware that there is digestion going on. Uh, and even if somehow we, we are having a self-conscious digestion, um, this, this, this self-consciousness does not really do anything in the sense it doesn't guide the capacity, it doesn't help to bring about digestion, the, the, out, the relevant outcome. It just, it's just merely associate. Okay. Now, in, in, what, in what remains, I want um, basically briefly explain how this idea of rational capacities help us meeting the integration challenge. Okay. So, metaphysically speaking, am I doing with time? Yeah, okay. Metaphysically speaking, um, this idea of rational capacities um, respects the point that action constitutively involves outer reality or external events, precisely because these rational capacities, as I have defined, are capacities for bringing about a certain outcome in a shared objective reality. So that's the easy bit, I think. The trickier point is the epistemological bit. And I will clarify this also with, with, by means of these additional remarks that I have toward the end. But the main idea is that it is the role of self-consciousness in the exercise of these capacities for action that underscores or that gives a foundation, if you like, to the subject's known observational knowledge of the form I am cooking or spelling words or whatever. It is because, that is to say, the self-conscious exercise of the capacity guides the exercise of the capacity and partly contributes to the production of what is happening in the outer world that we, have, we can have non-observational knowledge of what goes on. I will try to, to, to further clarify this by means of this um, final remarks that I have toward the, the end of the handouts. Uh, the first remark is this, that um, if this picture involving rational capacities is broadly on the right tracks, then the relation between the metaphysics and the epistemology of the domain, in the case of action, is particularly tight in the sense that there is, that there is an epistemological feature of action, that is the way in which we know our own actions, which is partly constitutive of the way of the metaphysics of action, that is of the way in which the exercise of the capacity makes things to happen, brings about certain changes. And the other remark is sort of the same point but phrased in a different way, is that the account can shed light on a sort of mysterious points made by Anscombe, that knowledge of our own actions which she calls non-observational knowledge, but also practical knowledge at some points. Knowledge of her own actions is the cause of what it understands. So it's no, it, uh, the knowledge that we have of our own action is the cause of what that knowledge understands. Now, if you're if you not familiar with, um, with this Anscombe's point, it will sound very strange because it's not, this is not how knowledge usually works. So take, for example, perceptual knowledge. Take my knowledge, my visual knowledge that there is a laptop in front of me. Uh, presumably, 
the fact that there is a laptop in front of me partly causes my knowledge of that fact. It would be mad to suggest that my knowledge that there is a laptop in front of me causes a laptop to be in front of me. That's not at all how knowledge works. But in fact, Anscombe says, well, in the case of action, that's precisely what goes on. It is because I know that I'm baking a cake that a cake is being baked. Now, if we go back for a second to the idea of these capacities, which are such that self-consciousness is partly constitutive of how they bring about certain outcomes, then this idea of knowledge that is the cause of what it understands maybe appears a little less mysterious. It is because I am consciously exercising my capacity of baking a cake that, a cake, that certain things are happening in the world. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll stop. Um, I'll stop here now and um, I'll, I'll take your questions if you, if you have any. Okay, let me... Um... Okay, thank you for the okay. talk. Shall I stop sharing the screen? Or? Uh, there's no need to. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Please, any questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, so my question would be the following one. Um, uh, it concerns the uh, last remark that you've made on uh, Enzikam's idea, the qualification. Yeah. So it means that, uh, yeah, when I'm uh, baking a cake or doing something like that, uh, my self-consciousness uh, is actually causing uh, what what it understands, right? Yeah. And uh, I would like to bring up uh, the remark made by by Kant in the beginning uh, of his uh, first critique. Uh, well, roughly put, uh, it says something that the reason can understand uh, only uh, those things that uh, she kind of makes uh, in advance for like. Um, <laughs> So what do you think? Uh, can we expand uh, what you've said uh, onto a theoretical domain? So when I'm uh, doing, say, theoretical physics, right, can I say that uh, my self-consciousness also, is also constitutive for, um, well, the outcomes of my investigation? Say, if I discover uh, that atoms exist, or I don't know, like uh, some entities that are supposed to be mind-independent, right? So can we also say, uh, and in which sense, if, if so, that, yeah, self-consciousness uh, this output or uh, outcome. Sorry, I, 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 I missed the, the very last bit, um, the, the, the very last sentence. Can, can you just repeat that? So uh, the question is, uh, can we uh, also say that concerning this theoretical activity uh, that is supposed to be mind-independent, Right, that uh, self-consciousness is also constitutive uh, for the outcome of these theoretical investigations. Say that uh, we um, well posited and have uh, found out that atoms exist, or like uh, I don't know any theory or any physical uh, entity that is supposed to be mind independent. So well, it um, it can be. I think it can be partly constitutive of the outcome of the investigation. Yes, but not of like the reality of the entities that are being discovered. That is just what, what I mean is um, it's not that I, I, I wouldn't say that atoms exist partly because we are doing these investigation, right? So in, in that sense, it's the knowledge of atoms would be like ordinary perceptual knowledge. I know that I'm that I have a laptop in front of me because there is a laptop in front of me. Okay. And my knowledge that there is a laptop in front of me is not constitutive of the laptop being there. So I want to, to keep that point. But it can be partly it can still be partly constitutive of the outcomes in the of the investigation in the sense in which say I don't know, say we are trying to prove a theorem, for example. 
um, the fact that I have proved a theorem is partly constituted by my self-conscious activity, right? And that's how I get to, the, to that outcome. Now, the theorem, if it is true, it, it is true independently of whatever activity or self-consciousness I have. But the fact that I have come to that outcome, to the proof, then it partly depends on a self-conscious activity throughout the demonstration. So that, that's what I would say. I don't, I don't know if, it's, um, if it answers the question. So your idea is, uh, well, it's yeah, actually a commonsensical idea that we have to distinguish kind of uh, epistemological plane and metaphysical plane, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess exactly. So I wouldn't like I wouldn't say. I guess I guess I'm not. I'm not. So what I'm saying is not that. Some form of transcendental idealism is true, if if that if that was the idea. That's that's not my that's not my point. It's it's a weaker point. It's just that for some forms of knowledge. It is the knowledge itself that is constitutive of that that, partly produces the object of that knowledge. Which is a very, I mean, if you take the, the, the standard analytic context, it usually seems a very weird idea, precisely because we usually have this receptive model of knowledge, broadly based on perception, by means of which, you know, whereby, well, knowledge is always causally dependent on its object, and it's never the other way around. In the case of action, I say it's the other way around. Uh, one uh, quick follow-up. So, what do you think of uh, social facts? I don't know, institutional mm. facts. So, uh, do they count or do, do they fall under your um, category of yeah, um, self-consciousness being uh, const constitutive for the, um, the existence of the uh, object? Huh. I, I, I confess I have never thought about this, but it's a very, it's a very stimulating... Uh, uh, it's a very stimulating question. So, 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 like an example would be, I don't know, is a certain form of government, say, I don't know, democracy. Uh, does the say does democracy exist because we are partly because we are we are self consciously um, bringing that about? I guess, yeah, I get, I get, I guess maybe, yeah. It's it's it sounds plausible. I. <laughs> I, I'm not able right now to give you a more specific answer, but I, I, I want to think about that. And it's, it's uh, thank you for the suggestion, actually. Cyril has, uh, has written a lot about that, exactly. So I know several books, uh, two, two at least. Again, sorry. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. In that, uh, on the one hand, uh, so we, uh, so our self-consciousness is constitutive for social facts, but on the other, uh, it does not really provide us with some immediate or, uh, well, yeah, immediate or uh, immediate knowledge or like it doesn't render them uh, transparent for us uh, just, you know, by, by the fact that it is our product. So it's, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have... Another two minutes for questions. Are there any questions? You can use your own microphone or you can, yeah. Can I go? Yeah. Well, um, hi, Andrea. Yeah, thanks for your talk. I'm, I'm not very familiar with this debate, so probably my question is like completely wrong, but so it's more of a clarification. So it seems to me that you define rational, I mean, it's in your definition of rational capacity, it is this element of self-consciousness is essential. So I was just thinking about what would you say about, uh, I don't know, artifacts, I don't know, or softwares that display some rational capacity because I don't know, you use the example of the child reading or spelling the word house. I don't know how about the fact that my phone can, do it as well? Is that a rational capacity without self-consciousness? What should we say? It's, I know it's, it's, it's a, this is a very difficult question. Um, 
I mean, I, as I said, it's not like, it's not essential that we call them rational. So the idea of calling them rational capacity is actually goes back to Aristotle when he defined what he called dunamis metalogu, it means basically powers associated with logos. And well, as you, as you maybe know, logos um, can mean pretty much anything. Uh, one plausible translation is rationality, rational. But what I mean here is just to say that, well, we have a sort of capacities which operate in a distinctive manner. And in us, these capacities require self-consciousness. So that's, that's, that, that's just what I'm describing. Now, if, like, if we want to, if we want to, to attribute rationality to, I don't know, a program or a device or a robot or not, I mean, maybe, uh, why not? But it's still, I want to say, there is still something different in the way we act and operate. Because in us, there is this self-consciousness that plays an essential role. Maybe a computer can bring about similar outcomes in a way that does not require self-consciousness. It's doing something that is similar to what we do, um, but it doesn't require self-consciousness. So if you want to, to apply the label of rationality to that too, I mean, that, that's fine. I mean, it's, I, I don't want like, to discuss words. I'm just trying to describe a distinctive way, a distinctive kind of capacities that we have and that in us operate in a certain way. That, that's, that's all really. Then I, I don't necessarily want to take a stance on whether like we can define a computer as rational or, or something like that. Um, I mean, if I had to take sides, I, I, I wouldn't be inclined to say that these things understand what they're doing. So there's still something lacking in my opinion, but I'm, like I'm, not, I'm not in a position to, to give very strong argument for this. It's just, just sort of an intuition, basically. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you uh, so much for the talk. Thank you very um, much. Yeah.